Hello, my name is Scott Dahl. I'm a master's program director and professor of digital marketing and revenue management at La Roche in Crown, Montana. Welcome to Leading Hospitality Through Turbulent Times. This session will be a presentation about 35 minutes with 10 minutes for questions at the end. We're taking questions in writing only, and you can submit these as we go along using the chat function. Just a quick reminder, the session is being recorded and is gonna be available on your school's Moodle platform afterwards. It's a personal treat for me to be here with you today, and I think you're about to find out why. My guest, Robert Alter, is a legend in the industry. Mr. Alter is a graduate of Cornell University's Hotel School, a current member of the Dean's Advisory Board. He's the Chairman Emeritus and founder of Sunstone Hotel Investors. For those of you that haven't heard of it, Sunstone currently owns interest in about 41 hotels operated under brands like Marriott, Hilton, Fairmont, and Hyatt and has a total enterprise value of over four, over $3.5 billion. Mr. Alter is past president of the Holiday and Franchise Association, former member of the Marriott Franchise Board, past president of IHI, which is the association that represents Intercontinental Hotel owners, Intercontinental Hotel Group owners uh, with the brand. Uh, we're gonna dig into all of this, uh, but first, Bob, uh, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Scott. It's an, it's an honor to be part of this group. So, uh, Bob, we've got a bunch of, uh, I'm going to tell you the number here in a second once it settles down, but we've got a bunch of hotel students on, on with us today, and uh, you went to Cornell. So I'm just wondering, before we get into the current stuff, uh, can you just reflect a little bit on studying and graduating uh, from Cornell? Well, it was interesting because I was one of those very few um, high school students that kind of had an understanding of what I wanted to do when I, when I, when I grew up. And... Uh, I was very fortunate that my uncle um, ran a summer camp, which I wound up working in the kitchen for many years uh, for, while I was in high school, both as a head waiter and a steward and, and, and those type of things. And as a result, I was very interested in the foods and beverage side of the hospitality industry. And, and it just so happened my uh, cousin, had gone to Michigan State, which was well known at the time. So, and so I, to be a little bit uh, ahead of him, I went to Cornell. I applied to Cornell and went there um, as a as a as a freshman who really didn't know very much. But uh, I enjoyed um, reaching yeah. out. All of my other um, high school students really didn't know what they were going to be. They said philosophy, and I said, "No, oh, no." I'm going to be very successful financially, and the hotel school is one way to get there. And uh, I, I went to I went to school, and uh, um, it was it was quite interesting because within the first I don't know second first two semesters, I realized the difference between the restaurant side of the business and the hotel side, <laughs> and 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 you know. Restaurants trade for five to seven times EBITDA, at least in the United States. And hotels trade between 10 and 15 times EBITDA. So a dollar um, created in a, in, a, in a restaurant creates $5 and in a hotel creates $10. Well, it didn't take me long to focus my, my interest in the hotel side of the of the space and all the courses that I could take in, in, in finance and development and those uh, pieces of the, of the learning puzzle that you could take learning to be a hotel owner and developer, which was my, my goal at the time. And it, and it turned out to be, that's what I did. So, hey, Mike, help me. Um, so, uh, tell me, you know, you're getting ready to graduate. We've got a number of students on the, on, on with us today. They're going to be graduating in the next couple of months. What was on your mind towards the end of your studies there? What were you thinking? Well, interesting that, you know, I went into turbulent times, not quite as turbulent as today, but back in, in, in 1973, that seems so long ago, 1973, there was, uh, an oil embargo and you people were lining up you know 
around the corner to get to gas stations. And the hotel business was decimated. So I went in as a, to, as my year of graduation was a year when it was extraordinarily difficult to get positions. Just so happens I had interned for a couple of years for a company called Quality Inns, they're now called Choice, and they had a company owned group and I had interned for them and they offered me a job and, and I wound up getting to, um, to be uh, an intern and an assistant manager very early with them. And that was the start of my career. Um, I went to, over the first two and a half years, I went to like 11 locations, opened hotels, um, was, their, was their troubleshooter, uh, taught people how to use the front desk and, and that type of thing. So here I was right out of school and getting a lot of real hands-on experience. One of the things that is interesting for me today, and I, and I taught at Cornell and, and, and mentor a lot of students, is a lot of people want to be in the development business or the ownership business, but they don't realize they have to know a little bit about how the hotel operates. And so I think that getting good operational experience for a few years, but not more than a few years, it is really good to set the stage if you want to be in in hotel development and ownership. Uh, and so um, you took those positions, right? You gained some experience. Um, it's very interesting to me that you mentioned that about getting some experience and being on the on the ownership side because I happen to know a number of finance people that learned the hotel business from you over the course of uh, of ten years uh, that we were or the eight years that we were together. Um, but you, you then got into your own company. You started to, uh, you moved in the direction of, of, uh, of really realizing your dream of having your own portfolio. And uh, a little bit of that, I think, is a very exciting story, right? Because it was done, uh, it done with a lot of creativity, we'll say. But tell us a little bit about when you, when you really started to branch out on your own. So I, so I had, I had two very strong mentors and partners early in my career. Um, my, my existing, uh, my first partner. Uh, lived in a little town called Steamboat Springs, and um, I had been sent there to uh, to foreclose on a hotel for a lender. And um, as part of this company, and then he and I met. Um, his, his wife ran an accounting company, and he and I met. By the way, Bob today is 92 years old and still a close friend uh, and, 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 and he and I did a lot of things together, but he was very, very um, uh, smart and he, and, he, and he gave me a lot of guidance. And one of the things he um, said to me is you'll never be, um, you'll never be in business for yourself until you are because you, you know, as an as an employee, you kind of make it up through the ranks and then you stay an employee and people have been with companies 30, 40, 50 years um, in their whole career as an employee. Maybe they got to be promoted, maybe they even ran the company, but they still were not an owner. And so he said, and he had worked, um, he'd gotten his master's from Northwestern and he had worked for Ford Motor Company. and he decided to, to move to Colorado and start his own business and he started a real estate business. He and I combined and created a real estate management business and started managing um, condominiums. And those condominiums, I, I would say, are an early version of Airbnb today. We rented them by the day, by the week, for other owners, and then, but we provided all the services. And it was in a little town called Steamboat. And then ultimately, we got the opportunity to buy a few hotels. Uh, I bought with him the, my first hotel when I was 25 years old. And I did that um, on a side, it was a little hotel on the side of the ski mountain, and it was called the Ptarmigan Inn. And I bought it for $685,000. 
Okay, that's not the cost, not even the cost of the small house today. Uh, it was 29 rooms, and it was uh, located right on right next to the, the gondola in Steamboat. And it just was coincidental. It was an opportunity. I had met it through my chamber of commerce involvement. I had met another owner. He took me aside one day when I was downtown Steamboat and said, Bob, I have a partner I can't stand. I'm going to let you buy the Ptarmigan Inn. I said, Glenn, I don't have any money. He says, you don't need any money because I'm going to finance it. I dislike this partner so much. We bought this hotel over a year ago, but we, but we can't work together. So I said, I don't understand. So I brought my partner in, the two, the two of us sat down with them. He said, will you buy it for $685,000? I'll take $50,000 down and then we'll do a wrap mortgage over the other mortgages um, uh, for $635,000. So that's how I got to be an owner in, in uh, three years out of college at 25 years old. And that was the beginning of my ownership uh, interest. Over the course of my career, I've owned about 140 hotels. Everything from 29 rooms on the side of a ski slope to 1,179 uh, rooms attached to the convention center in San Diego, uh, the, the big Hilton there. Um, and so, and everything in between. And uh, uh, when Scott and I worked together, uh, he, he, he revenue managed uh, this, this montage of properties. So originally, I went from that little company that we had um, and I wound up with um, seven hotels that were hotels that were um, partnerships that I put together where Bob or another partner or other partners wound up with, um, we, we all wound up owning the equity in these small little hotels. They were average size of 120 rooms uh, located um, in the West, mostly in Colorado. Um, we built some of the first Hampton Inns together with another partner who's, who had been an architect. And he taught me a lot about the build ground up thing. And we built five Hampton Inns from the ground up. Those hotels got to be the ownership group that my uh, management company ran with various ownership interests. And then turn the clock forward and I, I moved to California and um, the industry had gone through a bunch of different cycles as it always does. There's, you know, there's a cycle of five to seven years and then something happens. We had 911, we had the financial global financial crisis, we had the oil crisis, there's always something that affects the hotel business. We have something called COVID-19 now. Oh, it's affected the hotel business just slightly. They like <laughs> shut down 90% of the hotels throughout the world. And anyhow, so, so I, I had these hotels and they all had fairly large mortgages on them and, and limited part, partners, partners. And I met, um, uh, an investment banker uh, at a conference I was speaking at, and he said, you know, there's a new thing uh, called a real estate investment trust, which allows you to take your hotels public and create equity, and the public side gets to own them, and you get to manage them, and, you know, you can be the CEO of the company, public company, and so I spent couple of years working with existing hotels I had and you know, this investment banker and attorney and some other folks. And we wound up doing an IPO a um, long time ago and created Sunstone Hotel Investment. We also had a co another company called Sunstone Hotel Properties. Um, and one was the manager and one was the owner. You cool. want to jump in? Yeah, you bet. Yeah, so um, so that was the beginning of Sunstone. You took Sunstone uh, uh, public as a REIT. 
Um, and then just before you and I met, you actually took Sunstone private again, right? I think with the uh, uh, with some help of uh, some in, uh, some private equity. So um, right, and there's the uh, uh, the Westbrook guys, right? And so um, so the structure changed, right? And then the structure yeah. changed, and then uh, so tell us about that. What was, what I mean? What was what was the reason for that, and how did that make things different? You know, to to get out of the public env environment into private equity. Well, what 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 I what I said earlier, which is really true, the the business, the hotel business does go through incredible cycles. And every time you think things are going great, there's something that's going to change. In nineteen ninety seven, our REIT had grown from seven little hotels to sixty hotels, from a market cap of a total of Fifty million dollars to a to a billion dollars worth of hotels, and the stock had gone from nine fifty to seventeen dollars. Uh, along the way, we used our stock to buy other companies, to buy other hotels, and we had run this thing for five years of real solid growth. Wall Wall, Wall Street loved us, and then and then. We had, there was something called the Russian financial crisis. Right? Nobody, it's <laughs> like a pin on the map now. Nobody remembers it. But our stock went from $17 to $6 in about two months. And all of a sudden, things that didn't matter before mattered. So we were about eight times levered, and that became an issue for the investors because the investors wanted less risk. So one of the things that I had done with that stock when it was, um, when it was uh, moving fast, so we bought a company called Keller Hotel Company from this firm called Westbrook Investors. They, um, we purchased the company and we made them take $50 million size of the entire company story, $50 million of stock. And they got the stock at $14. And then the stock went to $16, $17, and then to $18. And then the stock went to $6. Now they had two seats on the board and they own um, about 10% of the company. So I got a call from the the founder of that company, and he said, Bob, we liked you at 14. We, we loved you at 17. At $6, not so much. <laughs> you have to either do something. So we're either going to sell the company or take it private. Now, in the new structure, in the new structure, in the old structure, they own 10%, and I had 90% public investors. And I had a board, and they were just two seats of nine people. So they really didn't control the tr the deal. So we had a former special committee, and we had, in fact, took a, a process, and we actually had another a bidder along the way. But the bidder, the ultimate deal came down where the management team and Westbrook bought the company um, for ten dollars and thirty five cents. And we bought the company with a structure where Westbrook was 95% with their real estate opportunity fund and Sunstone management team was 5%. And we took out all of the public investors. One of the th transact part of the transactions was we took the management company and operating company, Sunstone Hotel Properties, and we, the management group, put that in to the new deal. So the new deal, which was a private enterprise for them, uh, went on, was owned and operated. So we didn't have two separate companies where we had an owner and an operator. Then we did that for five years. And, and during the time we bought hotels, sold hotels and, and created value. Our, our mantra as a company was always buy hotels that, need, that were broken and either fix them through 
renovation, repositioning, or rebranding. And we did a lot of hotel, uh, independent hotels to um, Holiday Inns, to Marriott, and to Hilton. And those, that success of, of changing that created a platform, um, which five years later, when they want, Westbrook decided they should exit, we went to the marketplace and decided that would be a great opportunity to sell the company again to the public and create a, a, a second public company. So, Bob, uh, just to... Just to clarify, when you said you sold the company for ten thirty-five, for everyone that's maybe not so versed in that, that's ten dollars and thirty-five cents per share, not ten dollars and thirty-five cents. So, uh, a right. little clarification, little clarification on on that for those of you that don't speak the finance shorthand. Um, Sixty and, million shares outstanding. Oh wow! Okay, so yeah, about a, about a six or seven hundred thousand, six or seven hundred million market cap. Um, and so, and when when the company was held by Westbrook is when you and I met when I joined you. And um, really an amazing time for me as a revenue manager, because as you mentioned, we were buying hotels that weren't great hotels and we were investing in them. And so how much fun is it for a person like me in my position to get new product, to get new product and compare myself to Star Reports when it was the old product and have just great growth? I mean, it was really a fun time, a fun time to run hotels. And that you mentioned that piece about Westbrook owning 95%. And I think that other 5% is really, really important because you have always, in my opinion, been a, a leader who has kind of brought people in and sort of given them skin in the game is a term that I think I hear you say a lot um, and really drive, really motivate us to uh, to really grab on and, and, and do our roles uh, and act like owners and think like owners and think entrepreneurially. So it was a really cool time uh, when that when that happened. And then the company went public. Uh, we took the company public again, and there's some stuff with REITs not operating their hotels. So you had to un unbundle the management company from the from the real estate, right? And and so what happened? How did that? Uh, what did, what did you end up doing there? Yeah. So so one of the one of the uh, technicalities were we looked at taking the company public as a standard company, and and then we looked at it taking it public as a REIT. Theoretically, REITs were created in the United States as a way for individual investors to own institutional real estate. I think with the tax law changes and everything else, it really doesn't apply the same way as it used to, but it has certainly evolved. And during so we, in order to take the company public as a REIT, we took the company and split it back into the operating company and the ownership company. And then we took the operating company and sold it to um, a bigger hotel company called Interstate Hotel Investors. And we required that company to keep um, our management team in place and as a silo. And then the, the re went off and, and, and became a public company. And as part of that public company, um, we, we uh, Bought bigger hotels, but the what what Wall Street wanted was more institutional real estate, and so where our average hotel size was like 175 rooms, it went to 275 rooms, and then 300 rooms. I think if you take the Sunstone today, they probably have hotels with an average of 400 rooms, uh, and so it the the Wall Street mentality was more urban, more major markets, and more institutional. And, and effectively, if you're a public company, guess what you do if the, what the investors want? The investors effectively run your company, the Wall Street investors, and they tell you what you should be doing. Like, they know much better than you do. And, <laughs> and, 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 and that really is the story of what has occurred in the REIT industry. Um, uh, I stayed on and then I stayed on as, uh, as CEO for three years and then became executive chairman for another five um, of that company and, and, and exited in, in my own personal portfolio. So. 
uh, you wanted to talk a little bit about the technology side. Yeah, I actually, I, I want to actually ask you one more question really about the third party management kind of uh, situation, right? We, we, when we were together at Sunstone, we managed hotels that allowed us to manage them. And when you evolved into a more institutional situation, you get into those bigger boxes, so to speak, uh, there's not as much opportunity to manage those as a franchise. Many times they're tied up with the, the brand management and, and that sort of thing. Um, and so was there, I mean, you mentioned that Wall Street was driving the bus. Do you have a, you know, is there a version of those that you would think is a better, you know, from, from your perspective as, a, as an operator and, 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 and an investor that's aware of the operation, is one of those better than the other as far as a company structure, do you think? Well, well, I think the, the issue of um, brand managed versus ownership managed um, will really come through in the next couple of years. Um, the, big, the big hotels in big cities are pretty much operated by the brands. So, and I think for your students, they must, um, they should realize there's three separate pieces of a hotel. There's the hotel itself that somebody owns that. And then there's the brand. And in cases in the US, 80% of the hotels are brand. In Europe, I think 20% of the hotels are branded. I think you'll see much more branded hotels in Europe over the next mm -hmm. five years. Um, but I, and then, and then, and, and then somebody manages it. And those three entities can be separate or they can be the same. I think for many, many years in Europe, Holiday Inns, Hilton, and Marriott were only branded and managed their hotels. They didn't have franchisees. That has evolved over the last 20 years. And I think over the next 20 years, it will evolve more. I think you'll see less and less brand managed hotels and more um, uh, franchisee or ownership managed hotels as it works its way through. Yeah, I agree. I think that uh, we're already seeing really a shift with the big brands more into service providers than actual operators of hotels, right? They, they provide specific, uh, you know, brand level services like distribution and those kind of things and, and brand marketing and stuff. So while we were together at Sunstone, uh, we were we were we were working together during the last what I would consider downturn that in any way gets close to this one, and that was after September 11th when uh, when business travel came to a halt. And the short time period after that, really kind of if you remember, it it was all of a sudden we were getting rooms from a new source from this crazy internet thing, um, and uh, and we started to try and figure that whole piece out. And then we started to understand a little bit more. At first, we thought it was new business. We were really excited. But then we started to understand more. It was really our own customers being sold back to us. And you got very involved with a couple of big ownership groups in, in really advocating and championing what ultimately became rate parity in the online travel agency world. And I was wondering, could you tell us, tell us a little bit about that? What was it like to collaborate across the, those companies to make a change like that in the business? And and looking back at it now, what do you think of rate parity in hindsight? I mean, we had something to do with making it happen, and uh, and what do you think of it now? Because it's kind of starting to get, uh, it's kind of started to get attacked a little bit in a lot of ways. So, well, we, when you talk about rate parity, I think there's, there's there's a couple of sides of that rate parity. First of all, what we were trying, what online people, Expedia, Hotels.com, Booking.com. And those type of people were having running ads saying you can get a better price if you go to them versus going to the hotel direct or going to any other the travel agent or anybody else. And we wanted to extinguish that myth. And what we did was we got the brands to accept the best rate guarantee. So at each brand. Holiday, Marriott, Hilton, they all accepted that they would honor and say, at this hotel, the best rate to get is if you book direct or with the system, as opposed to a third party. And, and so for many years, there was quote, parity. And so the same rate you could get at the hotel was the same rate you could get at all the online travel agencies, which 
the online travel agency, if you add the value of those companies up pre, <laughs> pre-COVID, those, are, those companies were worth more than the hotel companies because the Wall Street investors thought they had great growth. So they would run ads and spend lots of money on advertising saying, you can get a better price if you go here to Expedia than if you go to Hilton.com. So we had to break that myth with the rate guarantee. That was our first thing. That was probably 20 years ago, where we convinced the brands to accept the, the best rate guarantee. Since that time, we've been involved in breaking the best rate guarantee in a different way, where if you are a member of Hilton Honors from Marriott Rewards Bonvoy now, or in IHG's um, owner's uh, point system, I forget what it's called. You priority, can get priority club. A, what? Pr- a priority, priority club still, I think. Yeah. yeah, priority club. You can actually get a discount against that rate that's in the market. So if a hotel is in the market at $100 everywhere, including at the brand site, but if you're a Hilton Honors member or Envoy member, you can buy that room for $95. And that has kind of shifted back to the importance of loyalty. And uh, uh, loyalty uh, is one of those things that is really the brand's biggest value today is the loyalty points along with the, 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 the service levels. Going forward through COVID-19, one of the things that the brands will clearly have an advantage of is putting peace of mind in the minds of these frightened travelers that your room is going to be super clean. And that might not be true at the ABC motel or hotel. That might not, 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 might not be true at the Airbnb, but at the Hilton or the Marriott or the or the or the Intercontinental, you're going to get or the Hyatt. I think they all have come out with um, super clean standards, quote, cleanliness guaranteed, and that will be the next great thing that that the brands will promote. So let's roll it forward a little bit. So uh, I think that's, you know, most of us are aware of the member rate situation. Uh, Expedia and Booking.com have their own member rates. Everyone's decided to uh, hide their rates behind that fence and basically make consumers fill their wallets with those cards again uh, that for a while we didn't have them all and now we're back to having them all. But roll it forward a little bit. You're still very involved in that. The new buzzword a lot in, in distribution at least is net rev par. And you sit on the board of a company called Calibri Labs uh, that's founded by Cindy Estes Green. For those of you uh, that know a little bit about distribution, that's a big name in hospitality distribution. And she started a company really that's, I think, very involved in really an educational effort to help hoteliers understand, uh, you know, the true impact of distribution cost because it's spread all over our P&Ls otherwise, right? So tell us a little bit, how did you get involved with Calibri and what's that all about? Well, first of all, I think the concept that, Cindy promotes, which is called net rev par, um, really goes to all of these OTAs and, and the various ways they sell net rates, they sell gross rates, there's there's travel agent costs, there's direct booking costs of when you actually uh, have salespeople. And her formula and her program lets a hotel see the net rev par that get versus the gross rev bar because if you um, look at the hotel and look at the bottom line it's it's the it's the net rev bar that makes the money and you got to take the money to the bank you can't just um, live on occupancy and rate and so i i've known cindy for many years her and i um uh, and some other people we sponsored a study that she did for the American Hotel Association. And then ultimately she turned it into a company and with me and some other people uh, started the company. And um, for you students there, it it is small world, 
small world. Her partner was my freshman roommate <laughs> at college, <laughs> and, he, and he's the CFO. And it, it's a small world. Be nice to everybody on the way up because you're going to see them on the way down too. It, it, including including your roommates for those of you that are out there. Yeah, right now. it's a great yeah. one. <laughs> so, That's a great one. So it was. It's very interesting. She's built the company up, and she has gotten all the brands to give her checkout data. So she, through her database, knows where the where the where the uh, what the costs are and what the revenues are and what the net rep bar is and she provides different reports for lots of different companies so it's a startup it's going to be very successful i expect that ultimately i hope ultimately it replaces the smith travel that we have in the united states that has um, the database on all the hotels uh, unlike smith travel where they tell you about group transient and 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 contract this gives you 27 different um 27 different uh, sources of business so you can analyze your information and help you or help somebody like a scott do the revenue management so that you understand how many of these gates you should open and close when you're running your book and, and before we move on, I just want to, uh, those of you that have had me for revenue management, especially, this is not going to be a new thing to you, but I want to promote a specific article, and it's really a white paper that gets updated quarterly, and that's by Cindy Estes Green, and I'll actually provide a link to it on the for, so we can post it on the Moodle pages, but she produces and updates a very interesting document called Demystifying Distribution. And I would absolutely recommend it to anyone that's curious about this space. It really does a very good job of explaining all of the different components in a very transparent way and something that, quite frankly, is, is pretty convoluted otherwise. So that's really cool that you, I didn't know, Bob, until we talked the other night that you were on the board uh, with Cindy. But I've, we've, I've used Cindy in some of my classes. Uh, Cindy, Cindy's amazing. I think she's a, an amazing person. Yeah. That's not your only tech thing, though. Uh, a lot of your hotels, uh, your new venture, we'll talk about your new venture as we wrap up. Uh, but you've got uh, you, you're implementing some operations tech as well, and so what I'd like to do, I'm going to share a little piece of a video of something that you've got going on in your hotels, and let you speak over the top of it. And then again, for those of you that are out there watching, the entire video will be posted on Moodle, so you'll be able to see the whole thing with the sound and stuff. It's a really it's very interesting. But let me just share a little piece of it with you. So hold on just a moment, and then Bob, if you wouldn't mind, give us some uh, professional narration on top of it. That would be great. Okay. So here Okay, I think you guys can see that now. So here we go. Yeah. So so back um, a, a few years, I, as I said, oh. I left being. Yeah. It's very interesting. What's it doing? There we go. Okay, now it's calmed down. There we go. Sorry about that. So so back in uh, when I left Sunstone in, as chairman in twelve, I, I um, one of the things I wound up doing was. Um, <laughs> having hotels at LAX. And so there was an empty office building uh, next to one of my hotels that I was able to buy at a, at a great price. And I turned it into a 231 room residence in. And um, I had seen at a trade show, uh, a, this robot called um, Savioki. And these robots, um, you, you program, to have the map of the hotel. They go, they sit at the front desk and when they, um, they, they call the elevator uh, electronically and then they go and find the room. Uh, you see there's the little station where it sits. And so um, a, a guest uh, calls down and asks to have Starbucks delivered or or towels delivered, and the the uh, the, the front desk clerk um, programs the the uh, the robot take this to room 804 and puts the towels in or puts the Starbucks in, and then the robot opens the elevator, goes up to its room, rings the phone, and then the guest comes to the door 
and it pops open its lid and in the lid is, is this. Now you say, what's the benefit of having a robot do this? Well, in, in, in LA, we pay, including benefits, about $25 an hour for, um, for labor. We lease this computer for about $2 an hour. And so the more we can get the robot to do, the less you have, you don't have to have a, a person to do that. So, for example, I, you know, I'm by myself at the, as night auditor at 11 o'clock at night. And somebody says, I need two towels. And, and I might not have somebody else there to send up the two towels. I send it up by the robot. The robot's standing there, goes up there and, and, and opens and, and, and delivers the towels. So you have guest satisfaction, you have a me mechanized thing, and it's it's kind of a, a neat thing. If we can get this robot to also vacuum the hallways while we go, we're really going to be on top of it. <laughs> put a put a Roomba put a Roomba underneath him. That's a great idea. Yeah. I worked some night audit, you know, when, and I worked night audit at a hotel where I was by myself, and uh, I would love to have a robot like that because instead of that, I had a sign that said, "I'll be right back." I used to put it on the front desk and drop my towels off, and and uh, and then come back in a couple minutes. So you mentioned the um, conversion of the office building at LAX. Um, one of the things that I've always known about you and always really admired is how opportunistic you are. Um, different things that you did with co-branding of hotels and same locations way before people were doing that. We were, in my opinion, one of the first companies to cluster revenue management and, and, and attack that uh, function with fewer, smarter people. And so now your current venture, Seaview Hospitality, um, smaller, but very, very interesting. And I wanted to actually share a little bit about, uh, there's another hotel that's in that portfolio, very similar converted use of the residents in Beverly Hills, but it was a hospital that after a big earthquake uh, was no longer seismically um, okay to be a hospital. And so you bought this hospital and turned it into a hotel, including putting the pool in the morgue, if you remember. I mean, it was really cool. Mm -hmm. um, but um, but I think that that's, I mean, tell us a little about Seaview now, because I think Seaview seems like it's all, it's the culmination of your expertise. It also seems like you're having a little more fun. So tell us well, about that. It, you know, it's it's back to, it's back to the beginning. You know, you see, you see the thing where you go around a complete circle. So it's kind of the circle of, of, of ownership and these hotels, uh, which are, there's seven hotels in Seaview investors, which is a very small company. And, it, and there, it's really back to uh, worrying about individual hotels for the investors uh, with a very small team that maximizes the assets in really very strong markets. So um, it happens to have four hotels at LA, X, a couple up in Beverly Hills, and one up in, in Sonoma Wine Country, which is just north of San Francisco. And it just, it, it, it's 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 less about growing the company than it is about getting great returns for the investors. Uh, and and myself is one. Of, I'm one of the largest investors in each hotel, and that um, gives us an opportunity. Um, when I when I quote retired, I decided that it would be too boring to sit at home and play golf. So. Uh, my my project is taking opportunities and finding them and and, and turning them uh, into very profitable ventures. Beautiful and just really hotels. I think in some cases that others uh, uh, you seem to have kind of a, a a little bit better vision. I think sometimes Bob for seeing those things because there are some of them that we did. There were hotels we bought when I worked for you that I scratched my head. And then three months later, had to say, well, obviously, I don't understand yet because they were they were goodbyes. And I, I learned a lot from the time we were there together. So I'll tell you what, let's um, I want to I'm going to ask you for a word, uh, a word of wisdom at the end. But I've got a couple questions. Let's take a couple questions and then we'll we'll finish up. Um, the first one uh, is a really interesting question, right? You have a lot of experience. You've been through some things. 9-11, the Great Recession. I'm, <laughs> that, I'm not sure we were alive for that one. Uh, but um, what do you think is the biggest threat to hospitality? And what do you think hoteliers should invest? Where do you think they should invest to overcome it? Well, remember, uh, you know, hospitality is all about people treating other people hospitably. And uh, I think that might be Hilton's line. But 
I think the challenge for us in the industry is continuing to find good people that can provide that special touch of, for people and make them feel that they're at home. And one of the things that is challenging is as the structure of the company, of the industry becomes more institutional, you lose some of that personal touch. And the, 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 the you know, the, in Switzerland, I've been to some wonderful hotels where you really, you meet the owner who's standing in the lobby. And those days are behind us more than ever before. So we really, uh, as an industry, need to continue to have super interested people to take the role of, of creating the hospitality. Um, I, I'm actually going to be on a, on, a, on a Zoom call uh, in a couple of hours with the CEO of Hilton um, with a group of other owners. And, you know, he truly embodies the 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 aspect of keeping it personal and i think that's the big challenge for us going forward in the industry so bob i'm having a little struggle with my camera but hopefully you guys can still hear me i've got a couple more questions um the next one is actually a really good question and i, I really love this question actually so the person prefaces it by saying it might be a little bit simple but what qualities and traits uh, should a successful leader have well when when you when you're a leader, um, you get people to follow you. I think being transparent and honest and being somebody they can respect creates leadership. Uh, no, I call it the no jerk rule, and nobody wants to work with somebody who's a jerk. And so I don't know how that translates, but jerk. Um, in the American language, I think it's pretty universal. Actually, I think you're fine. Yeah. So you, so, so you gotta, you gotta treat people the way you want to be treated, and and you have to be somebody they look up to. And so, you know, they they create, you create your own image, and don't be afraid to be real, and be and treat people the way that you want to be treated. I think that's. That's the secret to leadership. I mean, I, I can vouch for that. I think I, I always enjoyed working for you. And one of the things I enjoyed working for you is it seemed like the few minutes that we would spend together, you cared. You would ask me a question. You'd wait for listen to the answer. Uh, you know, every once in a while, you'd send me an email. Hey, this is going on this weekend. I can't go. Do you want to use these tickets? And they weren't two tickets to the opera because that's not my thing. They were two tickets to the Lakers because that is my thing. So yeah. I really think that you're right. I think that when you... Uh, uh, you know, when you tune into people, I think they will perform for you at their best. And I can vouch for that in, in your in your case. So no question about it. I'm going to ask you one other finance question and then we'll uh, we'll kind of wrap it up. But right, there's a lot of pressure on the industry right now. Uh, this is a very good question. You know, rates are going up and down, uncertainty in the market and so on. What do you think's up with the I mean, are you a, are you a net buyer, or a net seller of hotels in the next couple next couple of years? I think it's going to be a, a real wait and see. I think nobody knows whether this economy is going to come roaring back or is going to become a slow throwback like we did, uh, you know, from eight to 16. Mm -hmm. it, it's going to be, it's going to be a, um, it's going to be a hard time. And for my money, my hands are in my pockets and I'm watching and seeing. And I believe that 18 months from now or two years from now, there may be some great opportunities, but it really depends on what happens. I think Europe is going to be really challenging. Uh, my wife and I spend a lot of time in, in Italy, uh, and I think the, have, Italy was one of the first economies to close down. Um, and I think it will take a long time till this comes back to the point where it was in, in 2019. So I, I'm 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 a, a sit on the sidelines for now. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I think that's a great answer. I'm still struggling to see if I can get my camera to work here for the end, but 
Okay, so um, we, we see your picture. Oh, you do. Okay, I just don't see. Well, it, it was just. Oh, picture. you see my uh, my static picture. Okay. Yeah. Um, I might come back here in a second. Let's see what happens. No, it's very interesting. Okay, so really, Bob, uh, thanks so much. Amazing. Yeah, um, oh, here we go. Okay, so amazing. I mean, really, uh, exactly the the wisdom that I hoped you'd be able to share. To be honest with you, has really been. Uh, it's been fantastic. It's been fun catching up with you. To be honest with you, uh, let me just give you an opportunity. You've got a whole bunch of people right now. I think. There's probably a relatively decent percentage of them that are looking at you and saying, you know what, if I could end up where he is by the time I get done, this will have all paid off. Uh, what words of wisdom do you have for him? Well, my, my, my most important thing to tell everybody is be open to possibilities. You don't know when the opportunity is going to be around uh, and around that corner and you just don't know. So don't be set in your ways and your mind. Be open to possibilities. The other thing I would tell everybody is your reputation is your single biggest asset. And people go around, it, it's a, the hotel business, the restaurant business, the hospitality business is a small business. And people tend to know everybody or know somebody who knows somebody else. And so your reputation as fair, honest, and hardworking is something that everybody appreciates. And if you're not, they'll know. Yeah, I mean, this is a business, I think you're right. This is a business that everybody in the building likes to see the GM roll up his sleeves once in a while. Um, and I think that that really drives, it really drives a lot of credibility. And, and I think as a leader, uh, it's one of those industries where if we're, if we ever let it out that we're not willing to do the job that the people that work for us do, we're probably dead, right? It's just one of those things that you, you're right. It takes a lot of respect, uh, to, to be successful. Uh, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for you. I think I, I would, uh, I'll enjoy the time we had, uh, the time we worked together and, and still one of my most, uh, definitely one of my most educational time periods in the business. Uh, for sure, and the things that we did. So uh, we've got, the, that's pretty much it for the questions. That's kind of gets us to the end of our time. But Mr. Alter, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for uh, for getting up early on the West Coast of California and joining us. And uh, I know based on the questions, there was a tremendous amount of engagement. Uh, so thanks, uh, thank you so much. It was really fantastic. And for those of you that uh, are joining us, I hope you enjoy the rest of the series. We've got some really great sessions coming up next week. And so keep an eye on your updates, keep an eye on your emails, and we'll see you guys all soon.